welcome to another segment of my YouTube channel. Today we are going to talk about pornography and masturbation. And I know this is a topic perhaps we don't talk about, but it's something that I believe that we should. I believe that um, not only men are experiencing this issue, but women are experiencing this as well. Not only single people are experiencing it, married people are as well. And we're going to talk to this gentleman who went through this phase in his life and he overcame it. So we're going to, be going to talk about, you know, what do you think caused him to be addicted to this and how he overcame it. And hopefully after you watch this interview, those of you who are going through the same issues or you know people going through issues, that this video will encourage you and, and show you that, you know, you can overcome pornography and masturbation. I just want to take this opportunity to welcome Carlton Charles to my YouTube channel. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jexel. Thanks for being here. Pleasure. Carlton, tell us about yourself. All right. So currently, let me start this way. Currently, um, I'm one of the pastors at Harvest Bible Chapel, Talks and Kickers, with the responsibility for outreach, uh, social media, um, preaching, discipleship. So that's currently. Um, out, outside of that, um, I love basketball. So oh. give you a little breakdown, right? So I love basketball. The Lakers are my favorite team, and they're only my favorite team because of LeBron James, right? <laughs> <laughs> LeBron is your favorite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> favorite, favorite player. Mm -hmm. uh, so I grew up in, in a Christian home. So my dad is a, a pastor. My mom passed away in 2017. So I have two brothers, uh, one sister. Okay. So that's, that's my family in terms of the, the composition of it. I'm married mm -hmm. to, to Monique, and she's here in Turks and Caicos. We've been married for 22 years. Oh. So praise God for that. No kids as yet, mm -hmm. but I hope that will become a reality here in Turks and Caicos. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a, a side joke. No, no, you're in the right place. <laughs> you are in the right place. Just, you're in the right place to have those children. And we'll talk about that from here now. I'll have you and your children on the Yeah, show. no problem. Your babies. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, um, and in, in terms of like favorite food, so people could know, um, I like codfish and, okay. and and salad or green banana. So that that's a little bit about that for me in terms of what I like. But I like connecting with people, yeah. um, like learning different cultures, yeah. you know, because I, I think it's important to be able to learn yeah. about individuals, and then you you're able to make a deeper connection um, with them. So yeah, um, in terms of St. Vincent, I uh, grew up in a Christian home, mm -hmm. uh, went to church, but was not solely sold on church. Mm -hmm. So you just go to church because, you know, it was part of the culture. it's part of the culture and your dad is a pastor and it is the thing to, to do. Yeah. So you behave like a, yeah. a, a Christian, yeah. but mm -hmm. didn't really experience any conversion or anything right. um, like that until I would say probably about 13. 13. So age 13 is when I made a decision, but that decision was based on fear. Okay. And the reason why I say it's based on fear, I heard this preacher preach one time, and um, he did talk about the importance of confessing and repenting of your sins. And if you don't do that, you're going to die and go to hell. And I was like, oh, I don't want to go to hell. No, so nobody wants to go to hell, I don't think. <laughs> so I, I was pretty much scared, went up and did that, but it didn't last long. Um, so I kind of fall off the radar and uh, made a, a, a full recommitment probably around 17, okay. uh, 18 around there. But, but it must, yeah, it must be tough to be in um, the child of a pastor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was tough because there, there's the expectation, right, yeah. of as a pastor's kid, this is what is expected of, of you. Yeah. Um, so despite all of that, um, there were different leadership positions that I had in the church. So I, it was from youth leader, yeah. and then after transitioning to youth leader, a um, couple of years later on, became a, a pastor of one of the other churches there. But it's still good, though, being a pastor's child because you're exposed to the Word of God, even if you have right. a relationship with God. But if you leave the home, I think in, in the back of your mind, subconsciously you'll have the Word of God on you. Yes, you know? yeah, yeah, definitely. So there are some benefits as well, being yeah. a child of a pastor. Yeah. Yeah. So today we're talking about pornography and masturbation. I, I saw you post this and I would say, wow, this is a great topic to have on my YouTube channel. Right. When did you, I mean, start having this issue? That, that's a good question because 
pornography, the, the addiction of pornography, if you look at the stats online, mm -hmm. it will tell you that as early as an exposure of eight, for some okay. people, 11. But for me, it was 13. 13. And that was at the secondary school level. First exposure was the magazine, Playboy magazine. Mm -hmm. A friend brought it, and I was like, I've never seen this around. So it piqued my interest. And then I start going through the entire magazine. And as I was going through the magazine, something was happening on the inside of me, mm -hmm. which is quite uncomfortable, and I didn't understand what it yeah. was. But it was as if I wanted more wow. of this. And so the next day, the guy brought another stack of magazines. So you get a rass and you get a rass. So as that desire kept increasing, I wanted more magazines to, you know, look at. So then it moved from just the stage of being curious to now exploration. Let me see beyond magazine what is available for me. So at the time, my parents had the VCR. You know the VCR, mm -hmm. the, right? I remember those things. So, <laughs> I mean, so, we didn't have any growing up. <laughs> but, but in those days, we had, we had the VCR and the video cassettes. Mm -hmm. And then I had friends who were working at the video stores. So it was more of like, hey, Colin, we got some new stocks. Mm -hmm. And they would simply slip that in, into my hand. Okay. So you didn't have to pay for it? No, I didn't have to pay for it. So persons would give it to me and say, hey, make sure you bring this back tomorrow after you look at it. So when my parents were not around at home, you know, I would slip that in, video play, and then I'll, I'll watch it. And it just created more curiosity for me. That was my first exposure, but little did I know that that would have sent me down a dark, diabolical road. Very dark. How was that? Why, why you say it's in the top? Because twice, two times, I almost committed suicide. Oh? Because... The depth of where I was with pornography, there was a guilt that associated with it. So you're watching, but at the same time, you're engaging with what you're watching. So masturbation comes into, into full effect. So we're talking about moving from curiosity to moving into exploration to now acting out to, what you saw. to what I saw to now becoming a full-blown addict, 15, 16. In other words, this is what it looked like, Drexel. From morning to evening, I was just constantly trying to find anything that is associated with pornography. And, and that included masturbation. So we're talking about more than five times masturbating a day. So you were addicted then? Yeah, just a full-blown addict. So when did you have time? Because you, when you were in school, or were you in school? I mean... So in school, take the magazine, you go to the bathroom. Oh. Multiple occasions. So at home, your parents is not there. Then you watch. And as you watch, you know, you, because they're not home, you masturbate right there or you go into the bathroom and then you, you do that. But that was the pattern that followed me from 14, 15, 16 into the marriage because I got married at 22. But then I want to come back to that. I want to still tell me how did that almost made you commit suicide? So it, it was a point of... There's a feeling inside that this isn't right. Remember again, context, you grew up in a Christian home. Mm -hmm. So even though you didn't adhere to much of the rules and regulations, the teachings were still applicable to one's life. And the fact that I had made a decision at 13 and then sort of like fully committed my life at about 16, 17, you, you begin to understand, all right, this is a serious decision than what I made at age 13. And now, understanding from that relationship with your parents and the devotions and what they were teaching about, because they taught about sex. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't hold anything back. Mm -hmm. You realize there was a guilt. So every time you indulge, you felt a guilt, a weight that came upon you. And then you would cry out and you would say, God, I'm sorry. And then like five minutes after, you're back in the same spiral. So I was depressed. To the point where actually I held a knife at my throat. I just wanted to end it all. It's like, wow. man, I, I can't take this anymore. Wow. And I, I struggled with that throughout my teenage years. Wow. And, and then I kept it as a secret. Mm -hmm. So my parents did not even know that I was Struggle. indulging and struggling with, with, um, with this act, you know, this desire for, mm -hmm. for masturbation and, and pornography. Wow. So you got married at 21. 22. 22. And did 
And you continue to yeah. masturbate and yeah. you continue to have this issue? Yes. Because I didn't tell my wife anything. I actually wanted to bring pornography into the, into the marriage. So you, oh, you wanted to, so you brought it up to her. Yeah. So I, I said to her, hey, um, you know what? I just wanted to explore what it means to like just watch. watch. She was very apprehensive. Like, I don't want to do that. Very strong, firm Christian girl. I don't want to do that. Why are we bringing other people into our marriage? And I was like, no, we're not bringing it. It's entertainment. I want you to see the deception behind the way how this thing had a stronghold on, on my life. And I was like, no, this is a great way to explore what sex is. Again, twisted worldview in my mind. But, but that's for me. I was communicating that to her. And she didn't feel like doing any of the things that um, I would have, we would have watched in, in the, in the mm -hmm. film. And um, I just basically, all right, if that's how you feel, I'm not going to bring that into, into the home. But that was uh, anger. She even, you're not going to let her know. I, yeah, I didn't let her know that I was struggling. Yeah. But the, the videos that I brought mm -hmm. was me saying, hey, let's experiment. Yeah. But I'm keeping this as a secret. Mm -hmm. So now she doesn't want to have that. The next phase that is often associated with an addict is anger. Mm -hmm. So you don't want it. Fine. I'm going to find a way to satisfy myself. Mm -hmm. So what happened was when my wife would leave for work because she owned the preschool at the time, 7 o'clock, I'd be on the computer from 7 to 3. Every single porn site. Then I had a card, maxed out the card. Wow. And then... 7 to 3? 7 to 3. So you were a missionary at that time too? No, 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 no. no, you, no. you were not working? I, at that time, um, 22, I was a youth pastor at my dad's church. Interesting. Yeah, so yeah. You pastor, so seven to three. Wow. Yeah. So, so seven to three, that would be my time engaging mm -hmm. in, in, in pornography. And then there were, there were other times where um, it would be just thinking about it throughout the day. Because I did have several jobs, right, be, before. So you kind of did like some side jobs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But you were still involved mm -hmm. in, in it. So you th were you thinking about what you saw on the videos, or were you thinking about how it would be with your wife? So what I saw on the videos what was exactly what I wanted to play out in real life, both with other women mm -hmm. and with my wife. Mm -hmm. Now, let me, let me stick a pin here. I did not go out and have sex I understand. with other women, even though I that was size. addicted. Mm -hmm. So, yes. I fantasize because here's the view that I held. I ain't going to get any STDs. Because <laughs> you're not doing anything with right. anybody I, else. I, I'm not doing anything <laughs> with anybody else. So this is perfectly fine. And remember, I was a youth pastor. So I am addicted to pornography, but I got to preach on Sunday. And did you, ever, did you ever preach to the young people about not getting involved yes. in this type of stuff? Yes, Drexel. I, I categorize my life as a a hypocrite when coming to the full reality of what God had delivered me from I said boy you are such a hypocrite it was a goodness of God that really led you to repentance because I would be indulging in pornography the Saturday and the Sunday I have to go and preach mm. and, and I would preach and talk in the youth groups about the dangers of pornography so people you know the youths were like you talk about this so much I said yeah because it's a problem but they didn't know exactly that this is exactly what I was struggling with. Yeah. And, and let me say, it, it got to a point where uh, because you're an addict, you take it further. So I don't know if you remember the days of High Five and Tag, mm. those social media. Mm -hmm. So I created fake social media accounts and had like over three to 4,000 women. And then I had all these fake profiles all these nude pictures that I would pull from the internet. So they would be like, I want to know if it's a man or a woman that I'm talking to, so send me a picture. And I'll be like, no problem. Send them a picture. And then in exchange, you get all these pictures. So like my computer had folders upon folders of nude pictures. And you're talking about a youth pastor. And your wife still had no clue. No clue whatsoever that I was deeply ingrained in, into this. 
So at what point um, did you realize, I know you say you tried to commit suicide earlier, but at what point of it did you realize you need to deal with this issue? And how did you deal with it? How did you overcome it? Right. So I, I recognized that this thing was escalating. I couldn't control it. If I were to be honest with you, and I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm not saying that some demon was inside me. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying, I felt oppressed to the point where something else was controlling me. And I, Drex said, I didn't have control over it. Something was controlling you, probably. So, yeah, yeah. So I didn't have control over it. So what happened was, every time I watched pornography or masturbated, I would cry because there's a guilt associated with it. And I would go to God. And I remember one time kneeling down at the bedside and I was like, God, please, just deliver me from this. Just take this problem away from me. I even went as far as saying, I don't want these desires. Again, you're young, you're naive, and you don't realize that God placed those desires there, but for a purpose, like, God, just take these desires away from me. I don't want this anymore. You mean it, but you go right back three minutes after. And then I realize this is not working. So I reached out to a pastor friend of mine. I said, you got to help me. He said, sure. It only lasted for like two weeks, meaning he says, if we're going to be in an accountability relationship, you got to take some responsibility. The stronghold, the seeds that was sown from 13, 14 was so deeply embedded into me. You can't get an overnight victory. Not saying that God can't give you, but I realized that that takes a while. It, It is a process. So he was... He was willing to help me, but I wasn't willing to see the need. Mm-hmm. I like the idea, mm-hmm. but then when it comes down to the hard work of praying and being honest, I pull back mm-hmm. on it. And then one day, out of desperation, I went online. And every single church that had, do you need prayer? I sent, I sent out, I'm a desperate young man who is a fake pastor. That, that's that's the so death. at that time, your wife's still not aware. My wife wasn't aware of anything. Your father's not aware. No, they weren't even no. aware. <laughs> so I just went out and I wrote down, like, I am a desperate kid. I'm a youth pastor. My life is messed up. I'm sick. I am just literally fooling people. I need help. I sent that out as a prayer request. I got one response from a lady in Taiwan. And she called because I sent my number. And she said, is this Carlton Charles? Is this the youth pastor? I said, yes. She said, I saw your request, and I'm willing to help you, but there are a couple things that you need to do. I said, all right, let's go. She said, first and foremost, you need to tell your wife. I said, no, that would be the end of my marriage. I'm not telling my wife. She's been faithful, she's been loving. My wife don't even need to know about this. She said, you have to tell your wife. And you grew up in a, in a, in a pastor's home, right? Uh, because that's, that's, we had some conversations. So she's like, you grew up in a pastor's home? You should know better. And by the way, you are committing adultery of the heart. And and that for me was like, no, I didn't go outside. And she was like, yeah, you read it clearly in Matthew chapter 5. That's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You are committing adultery of the heart. You're being unfaithful to your wife by indulging in all of these sexual fantasies. Even, even, okay, I'm going to come back to that. Yeah. Are you committing adultery even though, say you're masturbating and fantasizing just about your wife. Is that still considered adultery? It, it, it's, it's just about your wife. Right, right. That you're not, you're, it's in the picture. It's so still... so let's, let's deal with that question because that, that question, I'm not saying this is, this is a, a view that you hold, but it, it, the question leans more towards a liberal view of, I am thinking about my wife. So if I'm thinking about my wife, I am entitled to masturbate. But then when you look at what scripture says. It may not say anything specific about masturbation, but it speaks about certain principles. Mm -hmm. So 1 Corinthians 6 um, talks about our body in the context of a Christian. If we're looking at it, our body is a temple of of, of God, right? So he has redeemed you. And then Paul even talks about, so why take your members and unite them with a prostitute, right? And then you also look at the whole idea of 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you eat, drink, do it for the glory of God. You got to ask this every question. Is masturbation, which is solo sex, having sex with yourself, literally, that's what it is. Because your wife is not there to have the intent of sex where God designed for a man and a woman to be together, to enjoy that. But if you're thinking about that up here, 
I almost say to people, don't fool yourself. Mm. Because you're giving the devil an opportunity that when you're not thinking about your wife, you're probably thinking about somebody else. Because the Bible itself says, you know what? Don't, don't give room for the devil. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So the idea of you thinking about your wife, it sounds nice to people, but it's almost like you're deceiving yourself. Because the reality is, that's a thin line to walk on because now you are pleasuring yourself. You're moving away from the intended view of what marriage is supposed to look like between a husband and a wife. And you're now bringing in a distorted view mm -hmm. that is from the world. I didn't know anything. Any man I desire a wife anymore. Exactly. I've been satisfied. <laughs> so that, that's story. why I say to people it's a form of idolatry. I got you. Yeah, yeah. Let's continue with the pastor now about Ta from Taiwan. She said, you got to tell your wife. Right. You got to tell my wife. So mm -hmm. I, was, I was apprehensive about that. And you need to get a counselor, right? And you need to pull back. Third one is the hardest one. Like, pull back from what? From ministry. You need to be healed. You've been living a life of deceit. So you can just imagine how hard that is because as a pastor's kid, you got to break that news, right? So... I just told her I'm, I'm not going to do it. And she said, this is not for me, but if you continue like that, you're actually deceiving yourself and you're mm -hmm. deceiving a lot of people who see you as this pastor's kid who are leading them mm -hmm. but have serious heart issues that you're not dealing with. Mm -hmm. it's, it's deception. So uh, we, we talked on the phone a lot because she was committed to helping that me. That is awesome that she called you. Yeah. And the thing is, for her... She was a cocaine addict. So she understands the nature of addictions. And so she was saying to me, she was saying, you need to tell your wife. I had to muster up the courage. She said, if you don't, I'm going to call her. We're going to Skype. I said, no, 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 no. Don't, don't do that. I'm, that. That's my marriage. I will take care of that. <laughs> so I had to muster up the courage. And I remember uh, talking to my wife about it. I said, look, I, I've been keeping something a secret for a very long time. And... I want to let you know that as it stands right now, uh, I don't think I deserve you. I think you deserve somebody else. And I have been struggling with masturbation and pornography. And it's been a very long time, since 13, 14. And I want you to know that you deserve somebody better. And I just want out of the marriage because I'm not the perfect person. How long were you in your marriage at this time you told your wife? So that would be going in, we would say, about maybe close to coming up on, on 10 years. 10 years? 10, 11 okay. years. Okay. Yeah. So when, when I broke that news to her, I said, yeah, I think, I think there are other guys out there who love the Lord and they're truthful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just go and, go and have them. Find them. <laughs> <laughs> she took my hand. She knelt at the bedside. She said... <clears throat> When we walked down that aisle, when I said, for better, for worse, in sickness, and in health, for richer, for poorer, I meant that. So I'm not going to walk out this marriage. You are hurt, and you need help, and I'm going to get you help. And I broke down. Mm. I literally broke down. And she went all out to get help. So I was on the phone with the same lady. Mm -hmm. And uh, we Skyped. Back at that time, we Skyped. And she said, um, she said, Colin, what's the next step? I said, I'm going to see counseling. So Focus on the Family mm -hmm. had a counseling hotline. So I spent a good bit of while um, talking to a counselor who was addicted to pornography for 15 years. So all of the things that I was sharing with him, he resonated with. And he was saying to me, it's going to be a long road. You're going to get relapses but it's going to be a long road. But you got to let scripture infuse your mind mm -hmm. because it, it's all about rewiring your brain because, you know, all these images that you have in your mind stored up as a library, you, you have to commit to prayer. You have to commit to scripture and, and memory, scripture memory, you know, so. Because yeah, you get reminded sometimes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So how long that process took? You say this counseling. There must have been a great feeling, by the way, now that your wife knew. Yes. And then you went to counseling. So how long did the counseling process took? The counseling process took a couple of months. A couple of months. Okay. Yeah. I'd probably say like about um, six months. 
Okay, that's not bad. Yeah, so it was six months. It was very intense. Mm -hmm. And there were occasions where I had a relapse and didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. but you went back to... Yeah, Perhaps yeah, I went back, but they were they were on to it. Yeah, in in the questioning sessions, mm -hmm. they were on to it, and then you know I realized that I, I had to talk about it. Yeah. Okay. And then you stepped down. So I pulled back. Mm -hmm. um, did talk about it in the church openly, mm -hmm. and then guess what happened? Had a group of guys, six of them. They got up, came to the front of the church, and said, "I just want to thank Calden for being honest." But I want to let you know that I was struggling with pornography. Mm -hmm. All six of them, including my brother, who I didn't know was struggling with pornography. Were they married too? No. Okay. So um, for them, it was identifying that your youth pastor was struggling with the same thing that yeah. you were struggling. Yeah. And now he's in the process of healing. He's in the process yeah. of recovery. Yeah. And this would be good for us because we can learn what he is learning yeah. now in his recovery. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we're doing the show, because there may be people out there. Yeah. I know that there are people out there, yeah, but yeah. maybe there are people out there who, who are going through the same issue mm -hmm. of masturbation, pornography, and hopefully, you know, their lives will be transformed um, after watching um, this video. They don't have to be ashamed. Right. Um, they just need to seek, you know, help in overcoming it. So after you finish that counseling for six months, I know you say you had a relapse. Yeah. After six months or so, you, you, you overcame it. So, good question. So, after six months, there was a period where I was walking in victory. And I'm using that word because people can identify. Mm -hmm. Walking in victory. So, moving away from all of that desire and inclination for pornography. Here am I walking in victory. Here am I now being able to help people. So, then I transition from youth pastor to the pastor of another church. Mm -hmm. So that similar branch, but another church. So we're talking about, that was around 2014. Mm -hmm. And then major relapse, mm -hmm. major relapse. That's, that's like what, two years later? Probably about maybe say three. Three years? Three years, mm -hmm. then I had a major, major relapse. Um, and it was difficult, like, I wanted to tell my wife, but it's like, I wonder how she would feel. But I still was able to talk to her. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, because I knew the steps yeah. to, to, to get back yeah. and um, took the necessary steps in terms of dealing, dealing with it to, to recover and so forth. What do you think caused you to get a relapse though? I mean, is, it was something that triggered, I mean, or you came across a magazine, or what, what, what do you think caused you to relapse? A couple of things. Um, movies, I'm going to okay. name a couple of things. Movies, exposure to, to anything mm -hmm. that lends itself to loss Got it. creates a trigger. Yeah. So what happened was, whereas you had guardrails, you allow those guardrails mm -hmm. to come down. Yeah. So vulnerable moments step in, and then you realize how easy you become a prey. Yeah. And then what I realized in that season, my spiritual disciplines were down. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't praying. I wasn't studying God's word intentionally. Now, I didn't say read because anybody could read. It's important to read. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference when you study and meditate on the precepts of God's sure. word, and you make that word a home in your heart, sure. and it stays there. Mm -hmm. It helps to demolish any thought mm -hmm. that comes in. So I realized your spiritual disciplines were down. And that constitutes for an avenue for the devil to parade in my mind mm -hmm. and cause me to have a relapse. Yeah. And when you got the relapse in 2014, how long was that for? That was, say, probably about Maybe about a year or so. A year? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then once you went back and followed the steps, you, you're back on your sound yeah. ground. Yeah, and I, and I realized this, Drexel, I realized that the spiritual disciplines are the key to overcoming yeah. the, the strongholds. Because I look at this. You're talking about a kid who's been exposed at the age of 13 to 14. Once those seeds are planted, you're not 
it's, it's not going to be overnight. It, no. it's, it's a continuous yeah. process yeah. of yielding yourself, of avoiding certain things. So I don't watch certain movies, yeah. period. Uh, I, I, I guard my mind with, with God's word okay. as much as, as possible. Now, do I get temptations? Of course. Yes. Yes. I do get temptations. Mm -hmm. But people often get confused because they say, oh, I feel tempted like I did something wrong. I said, no. When you commit the act, that's when you're wrong. Yeah. But when the temptation comes, is what do you do with that right. before you commit the right. act? Right. You know. So it's it's to be able to bring scripture to bear on mind, divert your interests or energies right. some somewhere else, right. so that the enemy doesn't have a foothold. Right. But before we close, I want to ask you this question. Um, say you know your wife goes away. The anybody watching this for an extended period of time, like for a month or six weeks, two weeks, and you become lonely, um, what, do you, what do you do? I mean, your wife is not there. Right. I think that's a hole to, to cause you to, to masturbate mm -hmm. and, and, and pornography. I mean, have you experienced the absence of your wife for an extended period of time where you end up forcing yourself to, to engage in masturbation? Or how do you, what, what should people do if, if their spouse go away for a long period of time? Should they go with their spouse or should their spouse not go away? So I always believe the family that stays together <laughs> and prays together, it helps. There have been times in my marriage where my wife was away for one month. But in being away for one month, we're, we're communicating. This is not engaging in anything. We're, we're talking. But what was helpful is that I do have accountability partners in place to check up on me to find out how am I doing because you are forever in a war and you need good, solid men to uphold you. So for me, it's having that community people who you trust, people who hold you accountable, even though my wife is not aware and she is aware. So for us, what we've done is, and we've had, we, we have not had this for a while. At that time when she went away for one month, it would have been, here's a decision. My wife is only leaving for a month. Mm -hmm. Collectively, we agreed for a month. And that was, that was again, back in, back in St. Vincent. She would go to one of the other islands mm -hmm. And, and help us with some babysitting. But from that time, we have always made a decision to be together. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a good point. Do you have any closing remarks or you have a thing I read or any issue I've not covered that you would like to highlight? So a uh, couple closing remarks because people often want to know how do you get over pornography? Well, what does what the steps look like? And I would say first and foremost is to acknowledge that you have a problem. If you don't acknowledge you have a problem, you're not gonna get help. So one, it's acknowledging that there is a problem. And why do I say that? Because when you bring the sin of pornography, masturbation, the root of that is lusting. When you bring that to the light, you weaken its power. Pornography, because it's a secret sin, it thrives in darkness. If somebody has a cold, you and I would know. You would see the symptoms. Mm -hmm. They cough. Mm -hmm. I can't tell if somebody's struggling with pornography from the outset, unless they open up and say, I am struggling with this. So I've realized that the more you talk about it, you weaken its power. One of the backdrops was I didn't talk about it. One of the things that has helped me is to be very open and to speak about it because a lot of people struggle with it and to say, if God can give me the victory over it, then he can give other persons. So the, set, the, the thing is, bring it into, into the light. Have accountability partners in place. Prayer and meditation of scripture is a key thing in helping to keep your mind pure, guarding your heart against against. Um, any attack that the enemy would, would seek to, to bring. So yeah, that, that, that I would say. And, and 1 Corinthians 10, 31 is like a go-to verse for me. Like whatever you do, do it for the honor and, and glory of God so that he is magnified and glorified. Yeah. 
Well, thank you very much. And I really enjoyed this conversation. And I hope those of you watching, you are inspired and realize that, you know, everybody struggles uh, with something. Um, not because you're not a Christian means, not because you're a Christian means you can struggle. Christians are struggling as well. But the good news is that you can overcome it. You actually will be faced with temptations. But if you remain in the Word and you know you meditate on the Word, it will strengthen you against this war that you face. But the key thing is know that whatever you're going through, whatever the issue is, you can overcome it. So thank you for watching. And thank you. Thank you. You're too.